to LECOM Health Matters. Our guest today is Dr. Casey Becker. Welcome to LECOM Health. Thank you very much. You are what these days at LECOM Health? I am the chairman of the system of cardiovascular medicine. Well, we welcome you to LECOM Health. Tell us a little bit about yourself before we plunge into American Heart Month and the good things that you could help people learn about how to keep their hearts healthy. Yeah, thanks. So I'm uh, from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, my whole family is from there, and uh, I was one of the first people of my family to actually leave and go to school in upstate New York, where I did my med school. Did my training at Duke University in North Carolina, and uh, I begrudgingly left and went to Cleveland Clinic to colder climates and to an opposing football team that nearly <laughs> broke my family's heart to do advanced cardiovascular training. And, um, you know, I was in a window of time where they put out some interesting doctors in the sense that we did, of course, cardiology. But then we did interventional, which is uh, hearts and, and coronary arteries. But then we, at the same time, we're learning how to do valvular replacements as well as arterial and venous issues in the legs. And so I came out um, triple boarded in that sense. So I do all of the arteries and veins of the body, the carotid, the neck, heart valves, coronary arteries. And so you're like a one-stop shop. I kind <laughs> of am a ACEs hardware when it comes to cardiovascular diseases. And uh, so for 13, 14 years, I've been in Erie, Pennsylvania, and we've been um, just uh, excelling at getting all of those different things in line and, and working with patients to make them better in that regard. We welcome you to Lecom Health. It's our privilege, really, to have you on staff here serving many people. Oh, thanks. Well, let's jump into this thing now. This is February, and it's American Heart Month. It's a time when our nation pauses in a bit since Lyndon Johnson, and I believe 1964, actually designated February as American Heart Month, and we, in a sense, turn our attention to heart health. Having said that, when I looked at the numbers in preparation for this, we're not taking good care of our hearts. The numbers of people, if I recall, 18.6 million people died of cardiovascular disease, which is a 17% increase from 2010. Hmm? Those are high numbers. Yeah. So I guess my first question to you is, why in God's name aren't we listening? <laughs> Because we're obviously not. You know, so your, your question is very complicated. And uh, first off, I don't think any of us fully understand all the different nuances that go into cardiac and vascular disease, the therapies, the prevention, the treatment. Um, some things that I think we now know and are fully understanding is, firstly, there's a genetic component to this that you can't help. You're born with a certain set of genes and you can't pick your parents. Um, so then it's a matter of how do we modify what we can with regard to those genes? Of course, diet and lifestyle and prevention and not being in occupations that has you to inhale things and obviously smoking, diabetes, metabolics. There's a very large number of things that are going to impact the genes you were born with, many of which we still don't understand. You know, I will tell you today, it is still better to be lucky than good. I've you know, my whole life that and, way. It's better really to be truth. lucky than good. It's the truth, you know. And some, of, and we all know our friend Tom, who smokes and he maybe drinks too much. He doesn't eat well, Thanks and he gets so to much. ninety-seven years old, and he dies on a golf course. You know, um, there's some of that. But I think what we know is there's genes, there's environmental factors, and we're trying to get better about prevention, identifying you or your kids or your grandkids at earlier stages to get them away from risk of risk activities getting them screened for blood pressure, cholesterol, maybe some genetics that they may inherit, and then trying to prevent the disease before it manifests itself as a heart attack or a stroke. And we have a lot of great therapies for that. In fact, we spend most of our money and time on treating those. But let's take a hint from our rheumatoid arthritis colleagues who say, hey, don't wait until your fingers are like this. Do something ahead of time to prevent it. And I think that to me is what's more important these days than maybe where I was at five and 10 years ago. Let's get in and think about how we identify people at risk and what do we do to keep them from ever manifesting the diseases that, yeah, are increasing and are still the number one killer of men and women. Well, that makes good sense. Prevention is always the best medicine. But what are some of those things that an individual, when they hear this, should identify that and say to themselves, I'm going to go to my doctor. Yeah. So, so this is another very interesting and very complicated question. And I think what I this wasn't really going to ask you easy ones. I stayed up all <laughs> night figuring the hardest well, ones. Listen, I, ask you. I would talk about this all night and day, whether we were on camera or not, because this is something that's very fascinating. And so, so part of my training, a large part of it actually, was clinical research design and interpretation. What your question really is is population health statistics, meaning that what is the most good for the buck? 
You know, what, what can we do to get the most out of things? And so when we look at interventions, whether it's coronary stents in the heart or valves in the heart or medications, whatnot, you know, we get really excited when we take something from, let's say, a 10% incidence rate to eight. We say, that's amazing. Look what we've done. Fair enough, but you've gone from 10%, which isn't that high, to eight, which is still not all that high, versus treating blood pressure when you're 40 or 50 or even 30, treating your cholesterol earlier, the implication of that from a global perspective is unbelievable. And it's so much easier and cheaper and a lot of times doesn't, doesn't cost anything. So when you say, you know, what really would matter? Well, it's almost like investing in your 401k when you're 25. You don't want to do it. You don't have the money. It's painful to put that $100 a month away, but gosh, if you do, it adds up. It adds up. And it's true of your cholesterol, of avoiding risk activities such as smoking or occupational environment, vaping these days. I mean, mm -hmm. if you can do these small little things, they do add up like compounding interest. And so I would encourage folks that even if you, I'm young, my family history is great, whatever, that's great, but take advantage of that luck. Take advantage of it and ride it home. Now, if you're into middle or later life and you say to your question, I'm starting to have pain or pressure in my chest. I'm having shortness of breath doing things that used to not cause me trouble. That's always a reason to go take a look. It could be that it's winter and eerie and you're deconditioned. You've gained a little weight after the holidays. Wonderful, we'll get you on a plan, get you there. But anything that is giving you signs or symptoms that are new, different, or worse, you should look into that. If your car did it, you'd take it into a mechanic. You wouldn't just keep driving it. And so, your ace is hardware of hearts. That's so right. And I guarantee you, if there's something wrong, we'll find it. And they shouldn't be afraid to come, should they? I, I find this so often that people are just talking to different doctors in our system. People are just, for some reason, afraid. Like they think the doctor is going to judge them. We're going to look down on them. That's not the case at all. We're here to help them. That's right. That's exactly right. I think there's um, a lot that goes into that. A, I think sometimes people are scared. People generally know well before I say something to them that there's something wrong. Men especially. Oh, we're terrible. Men, oh, and I'm as bad. And that's why I think I get along with my patients very well because I'm probably worse than any of them. Sometimes Physician heal thyself. That's it's it. It's like and father you, go to confession once in a while. <laughs> you know, I kind of know, and I just don't want to hear you say it because now it's real. And if it's real, I have to deal with it. If my wife hears that it's real uh, or my partner, now we have to deal with it. And just something about the psychology of all of us, um, it just makes it harder to swallow the pill, even though you kind of already knew there was something wrong. You shouldn't be, there's no judging here. This is what we do. I mean, we are here to see and take care of people. Um, so don't be afraid of putting a label and name on it because I promise you this, if you ignore something like this, you will pay for it. The question is where and how. You know, you don't want to be one of those 30, 40% of people who learn that they have heart disease by having a heart attack. You know, that is not going to serve you well. So whatever the barriers to care, whatever the fear, whatever the whatever, I assure you, you're going to do better just coming in and getting it looked at than waiting until you finally have no chance and you're coming in by ambulance. Well, I think there's a lot to be said, Casey, about people. They're simply afraid. They're afraid of what they're going to hear. They're afraid of what's going to happen to them. And this is, visits to you are not pleasant. It's not first on your list of things to do, but it's not intimidating either. No. Well, firstly, I hope people come and actually enjoy their visit. Their visit. And I really do mean that. I mean, I, I now, you know, listen, there's a, there's a patient, there's a friend and there's a family and there's a barrier, but you know, most of my patients, I have a, a friendly relationship with, and honestly, because I enjoy that. But secondly, I well, feel like- you enjoy like talking with them. You enjoy them as people. I sure do. I mean, there's. A, I live in the same area they do. I have many of the same interests that they do. We shop at the same place. We watch the same TV. In general, I find these to be friends and family. And I'll tell you the other thing. I do a far better job with you. If I can sit with you and understand you, and where you eat and drink and what you... I get it more than, you know, if you came from... Bahrain and I didn't understand your culture or your restaurants or anything. It's I very think. hard for me to, to, so, you know, I hope you leave here saying it was interesting. I learned, we had some laughs, we got common ground. And even if there was a problem, maybe it's a major one. I want you to understand when you go, we've got this under control.
you and I will come through this and we're going to have a game plan. And it is very rare that I say, you know, it's been a great time talking to you, but I'm sorry, there's nothing for you. I can't think of the last time I said that. So uh, you're going to leave better. So other than, not other than, you know, the things you've earlier talked about are things we can normally do to prevent ourselves from having that heart attack, from having that stroke. Those are things we should do. How about blood pressure? I see blood pressure machines all over the place. I have one. And every time I take it, it's all over the block. What what should my blood, what's a healthy blood pressure? Because I quite frankly don't know. So I'll tell you, it's funny. You've asked another very complicated question. I bet you didn't think you did. And I was just rounding with a medical student. And he asked me the same exact question. He said, what, you know, what is high blood pressure? Because the American Diabetes Association says we want it no higher than 130 over 80. And the the American Kidney Association says this. And the Cardiovascular Association and then the USPSTF says this. And, And I'll ask you a question back. Well, when are you measuring it? Are you wearing a blood pressure cuff 24 seven? Cause when you sleep, it's different than when you're awake. If you're giving a sermon and your pressure's oh God, up. That's the last thing I'd want to do is take it. I usually take mine in the morning when I get up. Very reasonable time. time to do it. That's when your cortisol levels are pi- spiking. If you took your meds and you haven't taken them yet, you're at the lowest level of meds in your body. A lot of people like to do it first thing when they wake up. So I'll tell you the answer is we actually don't even know what hypertension is. Because unless we literally have you wear a blood pressure cuff 24 seven for a week. Or the halter. Or, yeah, and we get a rise and fall. What if your blood pressure is 170 over 60, but at night it's 90 over 30, you know? And we know that variability in heart rate blood pressure is very healthy. That's an intact nervous system helping you respond to the forces and the environment and the stresses. That's healthy. So I don't want to confuse the issue. If you consistently run greater than 140 over 90, you would meet criteria for hypertensive or at least pre-hypertensive. Maybe more importantly though, is what other issues do you have going on? Do you have diabetes? Do you have kidney disease? Do you have heart disease, heart failure, stroke? Are there other reasons we'd wanna get your blood pressure down with certain kinds of medicines that benefit the other condition too? So you're looking at it holistically. That's exactly what we do. It's, it's, we're not about throwing pills because any machine can do that. And probably next week they will. AI can probably do that. It can do a better job than me passing a test, giving you every study that was ever done on every pill. Again, the magic, and you keep seeing me say this, the magic about you and I sitting here and talking is that I can understand your lifestyle, what you're doing, your hopes, your dreams, your fears, your successes. Look at the other things about your medical issues, if you have them. And we can come up with a workable solution that'll be rooted in scientific study, but that also benefits your lifestyle. And obviously we want it to be as cheap as it can, be on your insurance plan, be something we're able to follow up with. Listen, these days, that's the magic. And that's what a machine can't replace. That's the only thing they can't replace. Oh, I think you're so right when you talk about this global holistic perspective, of patient, doctor, clergy, parishioner, clergy, student, whatever it is. It's not just looking at this item. It's looking at the whole person with a dual perspective. Where are they coming from? Where sure. are they at? You know, walking in their shoes and trying to go from that perspective as opposed to your number says this or the lab test says this, take this pill. That's not what you're about. Well, and listen, I think it's, it's silly to think that you're a very smart person. People are very smart. They all have these. They all have phones. They see TV. Do you really need me necessarily to regurgitate what you saw on a screen? You may, um, but you may not. And I think really what our job has evolved into is putting into context and personalizing the data that's out there for anybody. I mean, I'm very much a financial advisor of your health. And I tell people that from the way to look at it. I say to you, I work for you. I'm not the boss. I'm not more important. I'm here to give you my best opinion on your overall portfolio of health. And let's look at your hopes and dreams, your risks, your fears, your tolerances, and your goals. And we'll come up with what makes sense for you. Because at the end of the day, it's your body, it's your life, and the choices you make are yours. I just want to be able to keep you on the guardrails and and give you the best advice you can. What I may choose to be important, you may not. You may say, look, I love smoking. It's the only thing that gives me joy. And I want to smoke for the rest of my life. (laughs) Fine. Okay. Let's look at other ways we can mitigate risk if you're going to make that choice. It's not my job to judge you. So in a sense, what you're suggesting is this is a this is a relationship. This is not in a sense, I'm not buying a service from you to give me a pill. You're building a relationship with your patient. Yep. 
It can't work that way. The days have passed, the paternalistic way of, let me explain to you something and here's the advice and go to. That's not how any of us want to be treated anymore. It isn't how it works. And listen, life has evolved. The complexities are just too much. For this to work, we've got to be a team and I have to give you the best advice based on where you're at. It's much like teaching. Students are not jars to be filled with information. Students are people that you have to walk with. You know, the day behind, when you stand behind a podium and lecture from your graduate school notes for an hour and 10 minutes, those days are gone. Yeah. You have to build relationships, which is what you're doing. I have one final question for you because I read this on the way in. Has coronavirus impacted heart health? Because you hear so much and I tried to read a few articles naively, and I'm just, and I hear this question, people are afraid to take the vaccine, people are afraid to do X. Yeah. Is there a relationship or not, or is the question to be out of bounds? Yeah. Well, no easy questions from you today, obviously. So corona, coronavirus, we learn more every month. Some of it is anecdotal, some of it's scientific, and I think all of us would love to have clear, obvious scientific facts. I think we have a lot. I think there's a lot lacking. I think there's people on all sides of this perspective who have questions, concerns, convictions, and I get it. And so I try to look at this as objectively as I can. And so to your specific question, has coronavirus impacted heart health? The answer is in, without a doubt, it has yes. The question is how? Has coronavirus started infecting our hearts and our cells and causing heart failure and strokes and things? Not obviously, and if it is, it's at such a low level that it just hasn't really percolated and obvious. I'd say there were worrisome things early on. Well, maybe athletes are getting myocarditis. Maybe we're seeing this, maybe we're seeing that. Could it happen? Sure. Has it happened? Yes. Is it evolving to be a significant concern that most of us in the cardiology community are sitting here biting our nails? No. Thank goodness, no. Can these things happen? Yes. What is the frequency? It's probably very rare. So those direct causal relationships, thank goodness, appear to be rare. Do you know one of the viruses that really does cause really bad heart problems? Common cold and flu viruses. Really? And they have for 2,000 years. People go into heart failure, they get inflammation of the heart, myocarditis. Now the next time I cough, you're the first person well, I'm going to think about. Sure, but, and again, but again, uh, proportionately, it's very low. So can viruses do this? They absolutely can, and they always have. Here's actually how coronavirus has negatively impacted heart care. It took our stressed healthcare system that in 2019-20 was already stretched, and it put it to the breaking point. And so if the hospitals are filled with any disease, coronavirus, pumpkin seed allergies, if you strain a stressed system, the providers can't deliver care. So cancer care, cardiovascular care, thyroid screening, diabetes, all of those issues now get pushed back. Routine screening, routine care, mammography, cardiovascular screening, cholesterol, all gets pushed back. And if you add on top of that, someone's afraid to come to the ER because they might get sick. Now they're sitting at home and they're not getting seen for the chest pain, the pressure, the heart attacks. And the rate of heart attack and stroke went through the roof globally, globally. Those are hard numbers we can track, we know that. Now is that why cardiovascular disease rates of death have gone up? Probably not actually. Because oddly enough, in America, for the first time ever, the average life expectancy of men and women started to dip down last year. Why? Hard to know. Hard to know. I read somewhere that one of the factors over COVID that you talked about the importance of prevention early on is we got a little sloppy with our lives. We were isolated, yep. stopped exercising, ate a little too much, drank a little too much went way out of our patterns, weren't going to work, weren't mobile. So we're sitting around doing not a whole lot, which cannot be healthy. It can't. And, and I'll, you know, I'll tell you this, um, cardiometabolics, we should do an entire session on that. There is an evolving relationship that is coming out with incredible data. And this gets back to what you're talking about, which is the cardiac and metabolic relationships in the body, meaning how much fat I have, how much protein, muscle, my blood sugar, my insulin levels, my glucagon levels have a profound effect on the rate of heart attack, stroke, and death, and heart failure. And these data are coming out every month now where the relationship between a diabetes medicine and heart attack or stroke or heart failure is incredibly related. And so is the inactivity and the weight gain causing you trouble because of higher blood pressure, worse cholesterol, and then they take the pathways that they traditionally do and cause trouble? 
Or is there a cardiometabolic effect that having the extra weight, having the higher glucose, the insulin, whatnot, directly impacts the amount of heart attack, stroke, and death? Maybe, maybe both, maybe one more than the other. I'll tell you the final thing, if you're sitting in a chair like we are now, how are you ever going to know that you're getting exertional exercise-induced chest pain? Right. Well, you won't. And so if you wait until literally eating lunch causes you pain and pressure, buddy, you're in real trouble now. Dr. Picker, I want to thank you for your time. I wish we had more time. I hope you will come back and visit us again. That's my favorite thing to do. And I really want to thank you for being with us at Lecom Health. You bring a necessary perspective to what we do, and we appreciate it. Well, I appreciate y'all having me, and I think we have big things ahead. It's good to have you with us. This is Monsignor Rabino for Lecom Health Matters.